Well, good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, glad you're here for this uh, great series of lectures. We are really in for a wonderful treat, uh, both in terms of uh, intellectual stimulation and expanding our uh, knowledge and understanding, but also inspiration uh, as we uh, celebrate and deepen our faith. Our, we're so pleased to welcome uh, to our church uh, the Reverend Dr. David Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson is a prominent uh, lecturer on science and religion. He holds a PhD in uh, theoretical astrophysics and also a PhD in theology. Would, and he is eminently qualified to talk about uh, both of these things and the interface between the two. And as you know, this is uh, really a, a timely topic, uh, the interface of science and religion and, uh, and what that means uh, for us and how we can understand both and how they are not um, mutually exclusive uh, and uh, need not be um, a, a battleground. And uh, so we are pleased to uh, have these lectures and to uh, uh, have the experience of being able to uh, discuss and have dialogue about these things. There are books in the back, uh, not very many it looks like, uh, but I'm sure um, that if, you, if we run out and you'd like to uh, place an order, uh, that's possible. I haven't checked that with anyone, but I'm sure that's possible. And uh, is that possible? <laughs> I'll, I'll explain that. Oh, Larry's going to explain that. Okay. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead and getting into Larry's territory there. Um, in uh, 2001, at the World Methodist Conference in Brighton, England, um, Susan and I were delegates, and we had the opportunity to hear Dr. Wilkinson uh, at that point. And uh, I want you to know of all the presentations at the World Methodist Conference, David Wilkinson's were the best attended, I'm sure. They were packed. And uh, I was at every one of them uh, and uh, enjoyed uh, and, and was just inspired by uh, what he had to share and the way he shares it. And uh, so um, I'm really pleased to welcome him. Yesterday we had a chance to visit and get acquainted a bit, and he is a delightful person. And you will want to do that as well, have an opportunity 101 uh, as uh, the, over the next few days uh, to greet him and give him a warm Fort Worth welcome. Uh, you might be interested to know that uh, uh, yesterday as I greeted him, he asked a question, uh, what is the relationship between Dallas and Fort Worth? <laughs> and my answer, one word, Strain. <laughs> and uh, now I went on to talk a, a little bit about that, how we in Fort Worth have a particular way of seeing that relationship, and uh, some of the well-known stories about that. Uh, and he said, so that probably means Sunday morning I should not say, I'm so glad to be in Dallas. <laughs> and I said, you got it. That's, that's exactly right. And I want to tell you, congratulations are in order for Dr. Wilkinson. Just days ago, he was uh, named principal of St. John's College at Durham, the first non-Anglican uh, to be named to that post. And so we congratulate you on that, uh, Dr. Wilkinson. Uh, you've seen the schedule of lectures, and you know we are in for a great treat. You've had an opportunity to see the titles of those, and, uh, and it's fun just to read the titles, but... Uh, uh, I don't want to delay uh, Dr. Wilkinson's lecture anymore, but welcome to you. So glad that you're here. We're really looking forward to this and have been for a long time. So we're going to worship service, isn't it? We have the announcements and the offering, and we're going to have a message, so we ought to pray too. Um, I've come from Arlington Heights United Methodist Church, and it's a good thing the District United Methodist Women are meeting because there's not room if they'd all been here, and I'm sure they would. They're a wonderful group, and they want to learn as well. Let's join for a prayer. God of evolution and creation and every other theory that we've come up with to explain what and why and how, we're thankful for the power of your presence and this opportunity. We're thankful for 
the day that you have created for us, for the past and what will be. Help us to take full advantage of all of your creation. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your welcome. It's lovely to be here. Uh, Tim, uh, a very gracious uh, welcome. In fact, after listening to all of those kind of things you said about me, I'm quite looking forward to hearing myself speak, actually. Uh, uh, very gracious of you. And thank you for your graciousness in having me here and your hospitality. And I'm enjoying Fort Worth. And uh, it's uh, good to see folk who are serious about their Christian faith and want to ask the kind of questions that are important for us to ask in this kind of culture and particularly in the area of science and religion. And it's a great privilege to come and lead you in some of that thinking. And let me stress that uh, I, I come not as someone who knows all of the answers in this area. After all, I mean, just today we're going to talk about both the beginning and the end of the universe. I mean, that's a small topic, of course. Um, I come as someone with uh, a certain amount of experience, uh, but eager to learn more, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do that in terms of discussion. You've probably uh, heard the story of the um, a great professor of physics who was a world expert in a rather obscure area of the subject. Being a world expert, he was invited to many different places to give a lecture on this subject. And being quite famous, he had a chauffeur he used to travel around with him. After a year or so of traveling with the professor, the chauffeur turned to him in the car one night and said, you know, I've heard this lecture so many times, I think I could do it as well as you could. Well, the professor had a cold that night, and so, so he said, okay, you act the part of the professor, I act the part of the chauffeur, see if we can pull it off. They arrived at a prestigious university, a packed lecture hall. The professor was having a few qualms about whether he'd done the right thing, but acting the part of the chauffeur, he sat in the front row. The chauffeur, acting the part of the professor, stood up and gave the most brilliant lecture, word for word as the professor himself would have given. But being a little nervous, he rushed through, leaving time for questions at the end. <laughs> now, sometimes at prestigious universities, you often get rather arrogant students. There was one there that night, sitting right at the back. The student stood up and asked the most difficult question. The professor in the front row broke out in a cold sweat because he knew the chauffeur couldn't answer it. But the chauffeur turned to this rather arrogant student and said, you know, I'm surprised they let people like you into university these days. For that question is so simple, I'm going to ask my chauffeur to answer it. <laughs> now, forgive me, I don't guarantee the truth of that story. Um, but I do come in a sense as someone who feels more of a chauffeur in these matters than a professor. And that's simply because of the greatness of these matters. And so I'm going to talk for a little bit, uh, some of you might find that a little bit quite long, and then we'll talk together through question, discussion, and uh, criticism, and argument, and see where we go on it. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about the origin of the universe, uh, not least because of the interest that there is, uh, not just within the scientific community, but within a wider culture in terms of the origin of the universe. Big questions about our origins. I don't know if many of you have uh, seen this book, A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking, a number of nods. Any of you bought A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking? Put your hand up if you have, quite a few. How many of you have read A Brief History of Time by Stephen <laughs> Hawking? Yes, uh, right to the end? Yes, how many of you understood A Brief History of Time by Stephen? Yes, sir, if you would like to come and give the lecture, that would be very helpful. Um, as Hawking um, wanted to write a book that would sell about 40,000 copies or so. Um, the money from the royalties he w then wanted to use for extra nursing support in terms of the illness that he was battling with. Uh, this book, published in 1987, has now sold uh, 10 million copies worldwide. 
published into 33 different languages, reprinted in hardback about 56 different times. This doesn't normally happen with science books. I can assure you of that. Uh, why is it that this book has sold so well? I think part of the reason is Hawkins' own story. Tremendous human story of courage in the face of disability. And Hawking himself has become quite a cult personality. He's even appeared on The Simpsons, <laughs> debating uh, the space-time shape of a donut with Homer Simpson. <laughs> and uh, if you're not into The Simpsons, well, we'll have a little bit of Simpsons as the weekend goes on and show you uh, the profundity of the space-time uh, connection there. Um, but I think that's only part of the reason. I think part of the reason is this is a book which deals with big questions. This is a book which deals, well, Carl Sagan in his foreword to this book said, this is a book about God, or perhaps about the absence of God. Sagan, um, distinguished American astrophysicist, um, put a spin on the book. He, he was more of an atheist agnostic. And so for Sagan, this is a book about the absence of God. I don't believe that that's the case, I have to say. But I think Sagan was right that this is a book about God. It's about the big questions. One of the interesting things for those people who characterize our culture as postmodern is that these big modernist questions about origins and about whether God was involved in the origin of the universe still grab people in very big numbers, both inside the church and, interestingly enough, outside the church. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the origin of the universe. And in order to do that, I first of all need to introduce you to the universe. This will be a very quick tour because it's a very big place. We'll then talk about our current model of origins, that is the Big Bang model of the universe. And then we'll move on from there to say, now how does this relate to some of the theological questions? And what's interesting about this is that these theological questions have often been posed not by those within the Christian church, but by scientists themselves who have no religious axe to grind. It's as if the science has pushed forward the religious or theological questions. So that's where we want to go this morning. Is that all right with everyone? And I hope it is, because that's what I've prepared. And if, uh, if it isn't, we're in some problems. Um, I don't know whether we can have the lights down just a touch. Is that at all possible? Um, this is uh, a picture taken just a, a little time ago by the Hubble Space Telescope. It shows what's commonly called now the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And it's some of the furthest objects that we've ever seen in our universe. Some of these galaxies are so far away that the light has taken about 13 billion years to reach us. Now, light travels at a particular speed. Uh, the light from the sun, um, I've come from England, I've not seen it for a long time, so it's nice to see it, takes about eight minutes or so uh, to reach the Earth. The light from these distant galaxies has taken about 13 billion years to reach us which gives you a sense of the vastness of the universe. In fact, if we were to draw a diagram of this, of course, as we look out into the universe, so we look back, because the light takes time to get to us. And uh, most of our astronomy is in what's called normal galaxies. Uh, that picture that you've just seen is shown as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, HUDF. And we think that those galaxies were formed between 0.4 and 0.7 of a billion year after the Big Bang itself. So we're looking back a great deal in our universe. Let me show you the universe in a slightly different way, if I may. And for this we've got a piece of video, and if I could ask for it just to be clicked. Thank you, that's fine. Some of you will have seen this piece of video before. Uh, the idea is that we're going to start out with a picnic in a park. And we're going to expand the size of the picture by a factor of 10 every 10 seconds. 
So every 10 seconds, you're going to be 10 times further away from the picnic in the park. You get the idea? On the left-hand side of the screen, we've travelled about 100 metres or so. On the right-hand side of the screen is a mathematical way of writing the same thing. If you don't understand that, just smile as if you do, and it will impress your neighbours. Now, as we move through the universe, we begin to see it in different perspective. We see different details to the structure of the universe. For example, we've lost any sense of a city here. We see this big expanse of water. Is it uh, an ocean? Well, as we begin to transfer to our Apollo rocket and leave the atmosphere, we begin to see that, in fact, it's a great lake and some of you will recognize the continent of North America. Uh, if you watch Star Trek, we're traveling at warp factor one or so at the moment as we head out from this beautiful blue planet. In a moment, you'll see a line extend across the screen horizontally. Uh, that's the true speed of light at this perspective. I'll give you a sense of how quickly light travels. There it is. That ellipse is the orbit of the moon, about 240,000 miles uh, or so from the Earth. And that's an interesting figure for Methodists, by the way, because 240,000 miles is about the distance that John Wesley travelled on horseback, preaching the Gospel. Uh, we'll remind ourselves now that we are one planet in a solar system of planets, uh, orbiting our central star, the Sun. There's the orbit of the inner planets, Mercury, Venus... At Mars, now the orbits of the outer planets, big gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, a little thing on the edges of our solar system called Pluto. Some people think it's a planet, some people think it's just a bit of rock. We're now moving through a vast cloud of comets, so small you can't see them. Millions and millions of comets called the Oort Cloud. It was a disturbance in these comets about 65 million years ago that some people think led to the de destruction of the dinosaurs. Now, we've traveled quite a long way, but if we were to draw the constellations on the sky, they would look exactly as they do from the surface of the Earth. That's because the background stars are so far away. We've had to change scales now. We're talking about light years. This is the distance that light would take one year to travel. We've done it in just a few seconds. At about 10 light years, we begin to see that our uh, star, our sun, is one in a collection of stars which we call the Milky Way galaxy. A hundred billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. Some of you might be able to just see there some, some greys and purples. Can you see those? They're vast clouds of molecular hydrogen, maternity hospitals for stars. They give birth to about 10,000 stars or so, on average. As we move out from our galaxy and look back, you see this spiral pattern of gas and dust and stars. From one side of the Milky Way to the other is a distance of 100,000 light years. One light year, I'm sure you know, is 9.5 trillion kilometers. So I know it's early in the morning, but if you multiply 100,000 by 9.5 trillion, um, well, you can work out an interesting figure from that. Now, at this point, we begin to see our galaxy as one galaxy in a universe uh, of galaxies. How many galaxies are there in the universe? The answer is the order of 100 billion. So how many stars are there in the universe? Well, it's very easy. You multiply 100 billion by 100 billion. And the answer that you get is a lot. <laughs> if your mind switches off with the mathematics, it's of the order of the grains of sand on the beaches of the world. Now, immediately, we're into some theological questions there. I mean, think about the biblical images of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Think about the extravagance of God in creation. I'll come back to that uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, but... As you've seen, we're retracing our steps a little quicker than on the way we went out. Uh, we've found our solar system, this is the Earth, and if our aim is good enough and we have a big enough uh, parachute, we're back in Chicago. And there, by the, uh, by the 
the lakeside. Um, here's our couple have just had uh, the picnic. You can see, by the way, they're dressed, which decade this movie was made in. You can see, by the way, I'm dressed, which decade I'm still stuck in. But um, we've looked at the universe on the very largest of scales. One of the important things about modern science is the way that the very large is related to the very small. Okay? Now, let's continue our journey, this time making the picture smaller by a factor of 10 every 10 seconds. Let's go into the man's hand and look at the structure there. Well, at about one millimeter or so, we begin to see layers of skin. If we make the picture smaller, we begin to see blood vessels. If we make the picture smaller than that, uh, that's a white blood cell. Inside the white blood cell is the cell nucleus. And inside the cell nucleus, we begin to see emerging the spiral coils of DNA. Part of the stuff that makes us us. DNA is a complex molecule. Uh, you'll forgive me if, as a physicist if I want to just have a look at an atom in that molecule, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on a carbon atom. You'll see it emerging in the center of the screen. Let's go inside the carbon atom. We enter it just about now. Now the first thing that we meet as we go into the carbon atom are electrons. In this animation they're shown to be fuzzy. That's because of quantum theory. We haven't got time to do quantum theory this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everyone says. Uh, but we move uh, through the electrons and right at the center of the uh, nucleus, so of the atom is the nucleus, made up in carbon's case of protons and neutrons. The nucleus, remember, is very small, uh, as this illustrates. And the protons and neutrons are made up of things called quarks. We can't show you what quarks are like because we can't drag the quarks out of the protons and neutrons. There's a particular force which keeps them bound in there very tightly. And that uh, is uh, just about the end of our journey. Now, um, some of you may have seen that piece of video before. I've seen it, as you might expect, a whole number of times. I have to say to you, I still find it somewhat awe-inspiring. I still find it somewhat... Um, amazing. Um, and yet that's the universe that we're uh, inhabiting. That's the universe in a sense we're trying to explain. Let me just uh, press the space bar for a moment and it should take us forward. That's it, thank you. So where did it all come from? Well if that in itself is quite amazing, let's move on to say what's our current model of beginnings. <coughs> Big Bang model says that about 13.7 billion years ago, the whole universe, everything that I've shown you, the billions of stars and billions of galaxies, the whole lot of it was small enough to fit through the eye of a needle. At that point, the universe began to expand rapidly in what's called the Big Bang. On this next slide, I've attempted to put the history of the universe on one slide. Forgive me for being so bold in that. Our present age is 13.7 billion years. If I'd been giving this talk a couple of years ago, I would have said our present age is between 10 or 15 billion years. We're not too sure quite which. Uh, but we now think it's 13.7, and I'll show you why in a moment or two. Our present age is 13.7 billion years. Some of us feel it more than others at times. <laughs> Now what we can do with science, with our present laws of physics, is we, we think we can describe the universe as it was as we go back in time. So for instance, we think we can describe what the universe was like when it was only one million years old. Now that's a big jump from 13.7 billion. And if you're a mathematician, this isn't to scale, by the way. In fact, we think our present laws of physics work pretty well Back to a one second old. And if that isn't a, a sufficient jump, we think that our present laws of physics work pretty well back to 10 to the minus 43 of a second old. If you're not a mathematician, 
That's uh, uh, 1 divided by 10 followed by 42 zeroths of a second. Now, if you're a biologist or an engineer or a normal person, if you know what I mean by that, uh, you'll say, surely, that's such a small fraction, that's zero, isn't it? Well, not quite. At that point, um, our laws of physics break down and extremely frustrating to scientists. Um, I mean, I've got to be careful here. Uh, forgive uh, not just the accent, but some of the illustrations. Uh, I'm into football in a big way, but I mean proper football, of course. <laughs> uh, soccer. And our team is Newcastle United, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of. It's the best football team in the world. Um, we have a rivalry with Manchester United, who think they're the best football team in the world. And it, it's as if uh, I've been out at a church meeting and Newcastle United have been playing Manchester United in soccer and it's been televised and you put a videotape in and you come back and uh, you sit down in front of the television and you start watching the soccer match and it gets to three goals all in the 89th minute with one minute to go and in that last minute Newcastle are awarded a penalty to take right in front of the goal and just as the Newcastle uh, soccer player is coming up to strike the ball, you run out of videotape. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Um, and you've watched it so far, and when you get to the really crucial bit, it, <laughs> oh, so frustrating. Well, that's a sense of frustration at the moment that we have. Um, we've explained a lot of the story, but at 10 to the minus 43, our laws of physics break down. And I'll tell you why in a moment. 10 to the minus 43 of a second, the universe is extremely small, a fraction of a centimetre across. As it begins to expand, so it cools. And as it cools, the energy uh, forms different types of matter. Uh, quarks appear very early in the universe's history and they build the protons and neutrons. Between one second and a thousand seconds, Hydrogen and helium are formed, although they're not formed terribly quickly today. <laughs> Impress the space, space bar for me. Thank you. Uh, between one second and a thousand seconds, hydrogen and helium are formed. Now, the universe at this point is about 75% um, hydrogen, 25% helium in its atoms. And uh, that's important for a moment. Then, to cut a long story short, we uh, form stars and galaxies out of vast clouds of hydrogen. Now, I cut that story short partly because this part of it, which we still don't understand, uh, particularly how galaxies form, is not easy. That's the broad outline of the Big Bang. You might say to me, that's all well and good, David, but what's the evidence? After all, as the Lord said to Job in the Old Testament, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? you say the same thing to cosmologists. Well, of course, cosmology is a different type of activity to what we mostly think of as science. I mean, you can't ask uh, a college senior to go into a physics laboratory and explode a universe in a big bang. We're talking about one event. And so what cosmology is a bit like... Um, I suppose it's a bit like a crime scene, crime scene investigation. You go to the scene of the crime and you look for evidence to try and reconstruct what actually happened. Now, cosmology is exactly like that. And I don't want to spend too much time on the evidence, but three pieces of evidence were important for this picture of the Big Bang. The first was... Uh, what's called the redshift of galaxies, and was discovered between 1910 and 1930. Viemsley, for an Edwin Hubble and others, discovered that the light from distant galaxies was redder than it should be. And in 1929... Do I need another mic? Thank you. Okay, so... Oh, that's uh, very... That was a big bang in itself, wasn't it? Uh, in 1929, Edwin Hubble uh, said, that, said that this um, 
Redshift was due to the Doppler effect. How many of you know what the Doppler effect is? Quite a few. But even if, uh, if you haven't heard of it, you probably know what it is. If you stand by a road, uh, a fast car coming towards you and away from you has a different sound, doesn't it? It kind of goes, meow. That sounds more like a cat than a car. Imagine a high-speed cat coming towards you and away from you. The sound is different uh, because of the motion towards you or away from you. That's the Doppler effect. Now, to dig myself even deeper into the hole, imagine this cat is holding a torch and is moving close to the speed of light. As the cat comes towards you, the torch will appear blue in terms of its light. As the cat moves away from you, the torch will appear red in terms of its light. That's the redshift. And what Hubble was saying was that the galaxies were redshifted because they were moving away from us at tremendous speeds. The space between the galaxies in the universe was expanding rapidly. And if the universe was expanding, then the logical thing to ask was, where was, it, is it, where was it expanding from? That was the first piece of evidence for the Big Bang. The second piece of evidence had to wait until 1965, when by accident we stumbled upon a form of radiation that pervades the whole of space, the microwave background radiation. A form of radiation uh, produced in the first few moments of the Big Bang. And the third piece of evidence had to wait until the late 1980s, when the theoretical prediction and the observation of the amount of helium in the universe was consistent. So those three pieces, pieces of evidence were classically the important building blocks of the Big Bang. In the last couple of years, we've had a couple of other things which have helped us in this. Um, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe has looked at the details of the microwave background radiation. And in that, the Big Bang itself has received some confirmation. And from that, we've derived the age of the universe as 13.7 plus or minus 0.1 billion years. If you've done a bit of science, you'll know that's quite a claim, plus or minus 0.1 billion years. I suppose in all of this talk, you've got to remember the words of Sir Martin Rees, the British Astronomer Royal, who says, cosmologists uh, are never in doubt, but often in error. <laughs> you've just got to remember that as we go through some of this. But 13.7 plus or minus 0.1 billion years. And then uh, also in the last 12 months or so, as some surveys on the way that galaxies cluster have confirmed in broad outline some of the models of the Big Bang. Now, don't get me wrong in this. What I'm not saying to you, of course, is that the Big Bang is proved. Science at this level doesn't work like that. It looks for its evidence and it builds its best model. But what I am saying is that the model is pretty good. There are various things that we still don't understand. That's true of any model. For example, one of the embarrassing things for cosmologists is that we don't know uh, of 96% of what the universe is made of. Um, that's because, uh, also from the microwave anisotropy probe, we've uh, confirmed that 23% of the universe is in a form of matter which we call the dark matter. Now, we call it that because we don't know what it's made of. And 73% of the universe is in the form of an energy, which we call the dark energy, which you won't be surprised we call it that because we're not sure what it is, which means we only understand 4% of what the universe is actually made of. Um, you might say, he's got a cheek standing up there and telling us about the Big Bang then. Well, I mean, it shows some of the provisionality of science. We work with what we've got and make our models on the basis of that. However, there's one thing, do you remember, that's still frustrating most of all about the Big Bang? 
And that is why our laws of physics break down at 10 to the minus 43 of a second. And in order to uh, describe that to you, I'm going to ask for someone to press the space bar again. We may. And to, um, to suggest to you that in order to describe why our laws of physics break down, I'm going to have to, in the next 30 seconds, describe to you the general theory of relativity and quantum theory. Okay? So you're up for this. Those of you who aren't already asleep might just want to nod off quickly for a moment or two. Let me put it like this. Quantum theory, and one of its discoverers, Niels Bohr, deals with things that are very small in the universe. Protons, electrons. And it is immensely successful. It works beautifully wherever you apply it. General relativity, Albert Einstein is discoverer, talks about things on the largest of scales. How stars, planets, the universe itself moves and is shaped. And it works beautifully everywhere you apply it. And most of the time, these two theories work in isolation. In a physics department, uh, quantum theory works down one end of the corridor. General relativity works down the other end of the corridor. There's only one place where these two meet. And that's 10 to the minus 43 of a second. You see, at that point, quantum theory says the universe is very small. This is my area. No, says general relativity. We're talking about the whole universe here. This is my area. And the trouble is that these two theories are inconsistent. They don't fit together at the moment. And that's why our laws of physics break down. And that's why Stephen Hawking and others are looking for a way to unify these two theories in what's called quantum gravity. I said it was frustrating to scientists. And a number of years ago, Robert Chastro wrote this about the frustration that scientists feel. Forgive me for the sexist language, it was written a few years ago. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He's scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Now, is that, uh, is that actually uh, what we uh, think? Is this where God comes into it? Well, are you, are you all roughly with me so far? We've talked about the universe. We've talked about the Big Bang. Now, let's move on to some of the theological questions. Let me, however, acknowledge that we are part of a Christian community that does have a divergence of opinion on some of these matters. And at times, what has become a very strong divergence of opinion. There are those um, who view the first chapters of Genesis as a, a scientific textbook of how God created. And therefore, they would say, the universe isn't 13.7 billion years old, it's more like 6,000 years old. This, of course, is the position of so-called six-day creationism. There are other Christians, equally committed to the authority of the Bible, who say, no, the first chapter of Genesis isn't meant to be read as a scientific text. It's meant to be read as a theological text. That is, its primary concern is to tell us who God is, rather than about the science of the early universe. And I, I just want to be real about that disagreement, that controversy that we find ourselves in. And it may be during the question time you want to raise questions specifically about that. For what it's worth, my own position is in the second of those approaches. And that is to say that I don't believe that the first chapter of Genesis is meant to be read as a scientific textbook. It's important, I think, to get a perspective right. Galileo famously said... The scriptures are meant to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And that's not bad to remember at times. I think it's important that Christians have a debate about this. I think it's important that Christians 
are honest about our differences on this. What worries me, however, is that the debate has become so heated at times that it's masked or covered over what's happening in science itself. One of the fascinating things about science, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is that scientists without any religious background are beginning to talk about God. Why is that? Well, let me suggest to you four areas. And this will come as quite a surprise to some of you. Because we live in a media age where the relationship between science and religion is seen to be as a conflict. At a great expense, I was able to get a rare piece of videotape of two eminent philosophers debating this point. And so if we could click on the piece of video, we'll just be able to see that. Hey. Is this the right one for an argument? I've told you once. <laughs> no, you haven't. Yes, I have. Well, just now. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. You didn't. I didn't. I didn't. You, I didn't. you did not. I'm oh, sorry, is this a five minute argument or the full half hour? <coughs> oh, oh, just for five minutes. Fine. Mm. Uh, thank you. Anyway, I did. You most certainly did not. Now, let's get one thing quite clear. <laughs> Definitely told you. You did not. Yes, I did. You did not. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Didn't. Yes, I did. Look, this is an argument. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. It's just contradiction. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It is not. It is. You just contradicted me. No, I didn't. Oh, you did. No, 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 no. You did just no, then. No, no nonsense. Oh, look, this is futile. No, it isn't. I came here for an argument. No, you didn't. You came here for an argument. Well, an argument's not the same as contradiction. Can be. No, it can't. <laughs> an argument's a collective series of statements to establish a definite proposition. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It isn't just contradiction. Look, if I argue with you, I must take up a contrary position. But it isn't just saying, no, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. <laughs> Arguments are an intellectual process. Contradiction is just the automatic gainsay of anything the other person says. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. Not at all. No, no. no. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Good morning. I was just getting interested. Sorry, the five minutes is up. <laughs> that was never five minutes just now. I'm afraid it was. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not allowed to argue anymore. What? If you want me to go on arguing, you'll have to pay for another five minutes. But that was never five minutes just now. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm very sorry, but I told you I'm not allowed to argue unless you pay. Well, all right. There you are. Thank you. Well? Well, what? That was never five minutes just now. No, John, I'm not allowed to argue. I guess you paid. I just paid. No, you didn't. I did! <laughs> I did! <laughs> no, I can't argue about that. I'm very sorry. You didn't pay. Aha! Well, if I didn't pay, why are you arguing? Gotcha. you. There you have. Is that? <laughs> if you're arguing, I must have paid. Not necessarily. <laughs> you could be arguing in my spare time. <laughs> For most people in our culture, the relationship between science and religion is a bit like that. Uh, the two are continually uh, in contradiction. And it's as if, uh, after a few rounds, eventually the Christian rings the bell and says, well, the Bible says. Or the scientist says, well, the evidence says. Now, I'll show you that because at a research level, we're in a very different world to that. We're in a very different world to the way the media portrays this relationship. At a research level, what we're finding is a very fruitful and subtle relationship going on. And let me illustrate that um, in terms of four areas of questions raised by cosmology. The first is the question of origins. That's a very basic question. Does the Big Bang prove God? Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the argument which goes, if the universe began with a Big Bang, who set off the explosion? Have you heard that type of argument ever before? Well, it has a long intellectual history. It's called, strictly, the cosmological argument in temporal form. And we can put it like this. In fact... Instead of our laws of physics breaking down at 10 to the minus 43 of a second and leaving us with a question mark, isn't this where God comes in? 
Isn't this where God comes in to start the whole thing off, to get it going? There's an argument used by Pius XII um, and by an Oxford professor of mathematics called E. A. Milne. Milne wrote a brilliant book on general relativity. Um, and at the end of his book on general relativity about the universe, he wrote, the first cause of the universe is left for the reader to insert. But our story is incomplete without him. Now, is that a good argument for the existence of God? I have to say to you, no, I don't think it is. There are problems which have been well known for the logic of this argument. Uh, you use cause and effect, which you observe within the universe, and then try to apply it to the universe as a whole. Um, now, that's not easy to do. But more importantly, for me as a Christian theologian, this argument has two main difficulties with it. The first is what's called the God of the gaps. Charles Coulson said, beware if science has a gap in it of inserting God into the gap as the explanation. The trouble is, if science progressively explains more and more of its own area, what happens to God? God is pushed out into irrelevancy. And in fact, a number of people who've used this argument are forced to what's called a deistic picture of God. Now, the deists believed that God started off the universe and then went off for a cup of tea, or I should say a cup of coffee, not to have anything more to do with the universe. And often, in all honesty, my friends, I have to say to you, within the Christian church, as God the Creator is talked about, he's often talked about in deistic terms. As if God's only interaction with the universe was at 10 to the minus 43 of a second. But in fact, Christian theism is very different from that. The images in the Bible are not of a God who reaches out his hand and lights the blue touch paper of the Big Bang explosion. The images are of God holding the universe in the palm of his hand, keeping it in existence. The images of, of God in Colossians 1 are of the one who holds all things together, keeping it in existence. So that Christians believe in a creator God who uh, sustains the universe not just at 10 to the minus 43 of a second, but at every moment in the universe's history, whether it's 6,000 years or 13.7 billion years. God is the one who keeps the whole thing in existence. Now, I need a little bit of help. Give me a popular television show uh, in the States at the moment. What's popular? Sorry? Sex in the City. Thank you very much. Uh, I do know Sex in the City. Thank you for that. If I was to say to you, I was to say to you, what was happening on the television the last time you watched Sex and the City? You could, if you weren't embarrassed by the question, you could give us a complete description, the complete storyline of that episode of Sex and the City. Uh, you, could, uh, you could tell us how the opening credits introduced the show, um, what Carrie was wearing, what particular shoes she had on that day. You see, I know a little bit about Sex and the City. Um, how the four of them met for lunch and all the rest of it, what happened and all the rest, right through to the closing credits of the show. From beginning to end, you could give us a complete description of the story. But in answer to the question, what was happening as you were watching Sex and the City on the television, you could have given a different answer. You could have said, behind the screen a very complex series of magnets and electron guns were keeping the picture in existence. Now, you could have said that. You might not have said that. I don't know. But you could have said that. The point is, without that other dimension, if you like, there would have been no story for you to describe. Now, a number of scientists have used that kind of illustration to say, 
It might be that science fills in the story of how the universe came about, including the first 10 to the minus 43 of a second. But God is the one who sustains, keeps in existence the whole story from beginning to end. You might say, well, that doesn't sound too scientific. How do you make the link? And for some scientists, what they've said is, where do the laws of physics themselves come from? Now, that's not God of the gaps, because science assumes that there's laws there. But it's a question that we have to answer. Where do the laws of physics themselves come from? God is the one for Christians who sustains those laws, guarantees those laws, moment by moment. And so when Stephen Hawking comes along and says, I might have a theory that explains the first 10 to the minus 43 of a second, Christians shouldn't feel threatened by that. All Hawking is doing is filling in another little bit of the story. There are questions still that need to be answered. And so does the Big Bang prove God? My answer is no. But there are many scientists who are asking, what is the origin of the laws of physics? Where do these laws come from? Second is this, question of purpose. And this is the flip side. Does the Big Bang disprove God? You've probably heard this argument which goes, my pastor tells me that the universe began through the sovereign will of God. Science tells me that the universe came about through a Big Bang, through a quantum fluctuation. And then people say, now which is correct? Which are you going to choose? And I have to say, uh, in my own view, Richard Dawkins, a distinguished scientist, falls into this trap. He says, once I've got a scientific description of something, that's all I need. Now, I, I just don't um, buy this. I think we know in everyday life that things are a little more subtle. Um, for example, if I ask the question, why is a kettle boiling? Okay, I could answer it by saying that heat energy is being transferred to the velocity of the water molecules. The velocity of the water molecules is increasing. Eventually, bubbles fall, and that's why the kettle is boiling. Or I could answer the question by saying, why is the kettle boiling? Well, this lecture has gone on far too long, and we desperately need a cup of coffee. <laughs> now, which is the true answer? Actually, both are true, but different. And many scientists are saying, our science may take us so far, but there are other questions, particularly about the purpose, meaning, and value of the universe. And so, does the Big Bang disprove God? My answer is no. But we're left with the question for many scientists, why is there something rather than nothing? And if you've uh, read Brief History of Time, you'll know that after 167 pages of describing how the universe came about, Professor Hawking on page 168 says, but that doesn't answer the question, why? I'm nearly finished, and you've been very patient. Third, question of origins, question of purpose. Third, question of design. Um, this has been a remarkable past 40 years in cosmology where people have started to talk about design. I don't know if you remember a man, a philosopher called William Paley. Um, in the 18th century, Paley, uh, with many other scientists, used this type of argument. He said, imagine I walk across a field and I find a watch. Pick up the watch. It's obvious, said Paley, that the watch was designed. Therefore, there must be a designer. Paley said, when I look at the biological world, I see the same marks of design. Therefore, there must be a designer. The so-called design argument. Trouble was, Charles Darwin then came along and said, that which you think are marks of design, in fact, are produced by natural selection. And at that point, theologians felt the argument crumble. The only trouble was that no one told the cosmologists that this has happened. The last 40 years, cosmologists have been saying, as we look at the universe, we see some pointers to design. 
Things like anthropic balances. Can you press the space bar for me? Just there. These are balances in the law and circumstance of the universe which make possible life. Let me give you an example. Imagine here in Fort Worth, we had a universe-making machine. They don't have one in Dallas. Only in Fort Worth, <laughs> we have a universe-making machine. On that machine, it'd be very easy. You'd have two things. One would be something that controls how quickly the universe expands, the force of the expansion rate of the Big Bang. The second dial would control how strong gravity was, the thing that pulls everything together. Now, your experiment is, you set these dials to whatever you want them to be, and then press the start button, and out comes the universe. Okay, you get the idea. After a few billion goes, you'd find this is an extremely boring experiment, because it matters what you set these dials to. If you get the gravitational force just a bit too high, the universe expands but then immediately collapses into a big crunch, the opposite of a big bang. You don't see anything at all. If you get the expansion rate of the universe just a bit too high, the universe expands so rapidly that structures like stars, galaxies, planets and human beings can't form. In fact, to get a universe like ours, these two have to be very carefully balanced. In fact, they need to be balanced to one part in 10 followed by 59 zeros. Now, that's as if you're given a bow and arrow, blindfolded, and asked to hit a target one centimeter squared on the other side of the universe and hitting it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying by this, therefore, God is proved. What I am saying, however, is that for some, this has been a pointer to something deeper about the universe. That balances like this to make possible life are so extraordinary. There must be some kind of deeper purpose or story to the universe. Not just anthropic balances, but intelligibility. Albert Einstein famously said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. You've got to think about that for a moment or two. I mean, why is it that here in Fort Worth, we can sit here on a Saturday morning and talk about the universe back to 10 to the minus 43 of a second? And it's comprehensible to us. Well, at least I hope it's a little comprehensible to us. Why is it the mathematics of our minds resonates with the mathematics of the universe? For a number of scientists like John Polkinghorne, for example, um, the only reasonable answer is that God is the common ground of the rationality of our minds and the universe. And the third thing is many scientists are struck with this sense of awe. I mean, if you've done science, if you work in science, you'll know that science most of the time is a very boring and mundane thing. But there are those moments that uh, scientists call wow moments. When underneath the complexity of the universe, the beauty of the universe, are beautiful, elegant, simple physical laws. Again, for a number of scientists, they've not led to uh, a belief in a Christian God, far from it, but they've been pointers towards some kind of deeper story to the universe. My final point, you'll be glad to know, is the question of revelation. How can God be known? Because you might say to yourself, okay, I can see the thing about the kettle illustration, how you can have the scientific descriptions complementary to the theological description. Um, Big Bang can't prove God, but can't disprove God. There may be pointers for some towards a deeper story to the universe, but how do we know a creator God is there? Within the Christian tradition, the answer to that is that God has revealed himself, spoken of himself, in many and various ways. Uh, Richard Dawkins, with his characteristic humility, writes, Faith is the great cop-out 
the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. I think that's unfair to the Christian faith, to be honest. The Christian faith says that this creator God has spoken of himself in ways that you and I can understand. Not exhaustively about himself. Not to answer every question about every question. But supremely in his son, Jesus. And so, as we've gone through Christmas, I'd be surprised if you didn't go to a carol service where you heard the beginning of John's Gospel. And John does a fascinating thing when he begins his Gospel. He doesn't say, let me tell you about this man, Jesus. John does a bit of philosophy and theology with us. He takes two strands in the ancient world. One was the Greek understanding of the word logos. The rationality behind the universe. And he puts it together with the Hebrew understanding of the word, which is God's personal activity in creation. You remember Genesis, God said, and it was so. And John puts these two things together, and he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And you and I are knocked out at this. I can see you are this morning. We would have been there if we been there at the time. John, what a remarkable thing to do, to say that this rationality behind the universe is there because of the personal creative activity of God. And then, of course, John goes even further and writes, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. For we beheld his glory, glorious of the only Son from the Father. No one has ever seen God the only son he has made him known. Now I end on this point because scientists like Paul Davis and Fred Hoyle who have been affected by these um, insights into design um, end up with a God who's either a deistic God or a God who is a pantheistic God, a God uh, encompassed by the universe. The Christian claim to revelation in Christ gives us a different insight into who God is, the creator God. And I have to say, um, in my own experience, it's not been looking at the stars, but it's been primarily looking at Jesus that's introduced me to the creator God. And then from that point, it's been delightful to look at the stars as demonstrating the glory of God. I've gone on far too long. Let me stop there and pause. Thank you very much. We've got, we've got some time, Tim, for some questions and criticism and conversation together. Um, I gather we've got some, some radio mics, is that right? Um, or not? Maybe. But let's start off. There's a gentleman wanting to get straight in. I'm sure we can hear you if you... Please. Sure. I'll, I'll repeat the question simply for the, uh, for the recording. Um, uh, if the Big Bang is expanding, let's say, to the surface of a sphere, uh, what does it expand into? What's out there that it's expanding into? And I'm afraid my answer is I don't know, uh, but I'll tell you why. Einstein, in general relativity, reminded us that the universe expands not in space and time, but with space and time. Now, if that's the case, our spatial framework is part of the universe itself. Your question is quite valid, but it's a spatial question. It's asking, um, what is outside? The trouble is that all of our definitions and all that we can answer is within the universe itself. And so there's literally no answer to it. And that's why I have to say, and it won't be the first time in this weekend that I'll have to say I don't know. But uh, I'm afraid I don't know for that reason. Yes, yes there's... Yes, oh, sorry. Yeah. I think um, 
raises the questions to me, the very validity of the Big Bang, is that um, not where the expansion was so rapid that you'd have an open universe versus is there going to be a big crunch. I don't think anybody predicted. And are you familiar with the, uh, what I believe was determined last year, that the rate of expansion is accelerating? I am. And in fact, in the, in the lecture after, after lunch, that's exactly what we're going to be speaking on. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much. But carry on. Carry on. Yeah, Let's well, talk about to, to me, that... Um, Question, I, there, to me, no theory that I'm aware of predicted that the rate would ex accelerate. And to me, it just raises the entire question of the entire theory. Is like, I have no explanation. How is this possible? Is there some great repulsive force of which we are unaware? Sure. Thank you. That's a very important question. Uh, uh, specific in terms of the, the lecture after lunch, what I'm going to be doing is talking about the end of the universe. and. Um, um, talk a little bit about that and the evidence for it. But I think your question raises a very important point about the nature of science itself. And that is when something is discovered like that, and you're entirely right, nobody expected it. And um, in 1998, when we got the first results of this, uh, it threw the physics community into panic because we weren't too sure quite what was going on here. Now, I think it's important and this is the importance of your question, to realise that what then didn't happen was a complete rejection of the Big Bang. That may still be on the cards, okay? That's a possibility. But there was enough evidence for the overall picture of the Big Bang that the view was taken that what we were dealing with here was some unknown repulsive force. Um, that would uh, allow this to happen. Now, um, as it happens, as you probably know, Albert Einstein, in his first formulation of general relativity, had put into that a cosmological constant. Um, he'd taken it out because he didn't like uh, what it meant. And so there was some tradition to go back to, to say, by talking about a repulsive force, uh, this was consistent with our previous thinking about the Big Bang. At the moment, there are two or three suggestions for what that repulsion force can be, and that's what I meant by the dark energy. Um, there's no agreement on what it is, um, and it's one of those uncertainties that we live with. It's fair to say that some physicists have taken the route that you suggest, and that is to say, this questions the whole notion of Big Bang cosmology itself. However, most physicists have not taken that route. Now, you could say, and here we go into the philosophy of science with uh, Thomas Kuhn and, and others, um, uh, perhaps, you know, the, the, kind of the control of science by the elite and those who have invested in the Big Bang is such that uh, it exercises a force, and until those people die, until there's a revolution, we won't actually get a new model. Well, I'm somewhat sceptical about that philosophy of science myself. Um, I think there is a judgment to be made, uh, as you know, in any theory, in terms of evidence for and evidence against. You and I may, may make a different judgment, depending on the weight of the evidence. At the moment, the vast majority of physicists, cosmologists, think that there's enough evidence for the Big Bang, that our unknown repulsive force uh, is not enough to demolish the theory, but it, it's still a possibility as it happens. Thank you. Next question. Uh, um, yeah, someone's going to mark. Yeah. Well, if the uh, universe right here. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> if the universe is expanding, is our, the galaxies expand as well? Um, that's a good question, and uh, there is a there is a Woody Allen movie in which uh, Woody Allen is obsessed with due to the expansion of the universe, whether his head is expanding <laughs> at the time, and what this means uh, for his mental processes, as you might expect. Um, um, the, the best way to think about it is, it, I mean, there is a small-scale effect, but um, the best way to think about it is that the galaxies are being carried along on a stream, a river of expansion. The expansion of the space between the galaxies is so greater than the size of the galaxies themselves. 
that's probably the best way of looking at it. Um, the local effects in terms of galaxy formation and evolution are much more significant, and so mask any sense of that. Some galaxies are expanding simply because they're gobbling up their neighbours. Um, galaxies are coming together. Um, some are in the spirals are dispersing and physically getting larger. Um, other effects are going on as well due to tidal forces and all the rest of it. So it's quite a complicated picture. But it's best to think about the galaxies being carried along on a stream. Yes, thank you. Uh, sir, you talked about the uh, initial conditions uh, at the beginning of the Big Bang, and I read recently where uh, Hawking is rethinking that, saying that maybe there was not a need for initial conditions because uh, if you go into the imaginary axis, yes. you don't need initial conditions. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad we're dealing with all the easy questions, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's um, very important. Um, the, the problem with, with the 10 to the minus 43 of a second was partly the hope that if we got back to t equals naught, we would be able to specify the initial conditions of the universe, the way that the universe set off from the point of beginning. Um, what Stephen is doing is something quite different. And um, what he's saying is that uh, there's a possibility, using imaginary time, that the universe can be finite in its history, but not have a point of beginning where you have to specify initial conditions. Um, now, let me try and illustrate that, because it's not uh, immediately easy to think about. Um, uh, if I was wearing a sweater or a jumper, is that the right term? Do you know what I mean? Sweater, which had a pattern. It was made of wool, so. And what I did with a pair of scissors was to unravel the threads um, while leaving a pattern at the top half of myself, but just threads at the bottom half. If I then asked you, where does the pattern begin? Now, you could point at where you feel a pattern begins, but your pointing would be different from mine. We'd disagree because actually what happens in that case is that there isn't a beginning to the pattern. We know that there, there's a pattern up here, but there's no pattern down here. What happens is the pattern emerges or fades up, as Hawking would say. Now, Hawking's view of the universe is a little like that. That the universe effectively fades up from a quantum fluctuation. Um, making irrelevant the question of initial conditions. Um, the universe appears uh, as a small, finite, expanding region. Now, uh, just a word, a comment on Hawking, if I may, on this, because this is very important. Um, his basis for saying this is not to say, uh, I have a theory which tells me that this could happen. His basis for saying it is a little more subtle. He says, if I had a theory which brought together quantum theory and general relativity, then I guess it will have these kind of properties. And one of these properties will be imaginary time. And by the way, this removes the problem of initial conditions. Okay? Now, he's been heavily criticised for this, um, for not having the theory, but saying... Um, if I had a theory, it would look a bit like this, and this would solve the problem that I have. Um, I, I'm a little sceptical, but I'm more sympathetic to, to Hawking on this. Because, again, it's in these areas of physics, um, you have to speculate. Um, in or, what's the, <laughs> you have to speculate in order to accumulate, is that the uh, phrase? Um, in a sense, you've got to speculate in this kind of way, and it's going to take a long time. He thought he'd have the theory ten years ago. He hasn't got it yet. Bill, and then... I'd like to ask a theological question. Please. You say that the differences between deism and pantheism... Yes. No doubt you know also about panentheism. 
yes. which allows for an interactive kind of spirit within the universe and not simply identifying God with the universe itself. Yes. Process theology, I think, has been very helpful in allowing some kind of interactivity between God's spirit and us as people and also other things within the universe. Just yes. a comment from you on that? Yes, thank you. Um, a very important area, which I, I want to do justice to, in terms of the, the small amount of time that we have. Um, uh, pantheism uh, has been the way that Paul Davis and Fred Hoyle have allowed the science to lead them in that. Um, I'm quite open to some of the insights of panentheism. Um, uh, my friend Arthur Peacock for many years has uh, argued for panentheism. Um, and I think there's much to say about it in terms of the intimacy of relationship between God and the universe. There may be problems with it in terms of establishing enough of God's transcendence um, uh, in the light of that. And that would be the same problem I would have, um, or a similar thing in a sense with process theology. I think some of the insights are very helpful. Um, uh, the, the difficulties would be in whether it gives us a, a enough tension of imminence and transcendence, or whether it makes God too dependent upon the universe himself. Now, that's a big area of debate at the moment. Um, what I don't have is, you know, is an immediate 30-second uh, description of an alternative to panentheism or process theology. Um, uh, but I think the, the issues that they raise, particularly about God's relationship to the universe, and especially God's relationship to time, we might come back to and talk a little bit more about it. Thank you. We have here and then Wesley. And... Do you believe that um, our magnetic field with, will completely flip again as it has in the past? Gosh, um, I, that's a question that's um, a little beyond my professional capability uh, to ask. and. I, I, is that your area of interest? And no, sir. I, I love Monty Python and the right. UK. <laughs> fine, fine. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I don't know about magnetic fields, but the British flip quite often, and that's uh, um, they. I mean, as I understand it, and I, I, I mean, I'll probably be corrected by others who know more about this than me. Um, um, there are a whole number of cycles within the geological record. Um, in terms of flipping magnetic fields, um, enhanced volcanic activity. And there have been uh, a number of speculations on whether these are tied to terrestrial mass extinctions in particular. Um, the dinosaur extinction of 65 million years ago was not the only um, mass extinction, but there are a number of other mass extinctions in the terrestrial record. Um, I, I worked on a particular issue of this, of whether whether if comets were responsible for the dinosaur extinction, uh, whether they were responsible for other mass extinctions. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the lecture after lunch. Um, I, I, it seems to me that, that physically uh, probably it will. Um, and that reminds us in all of these things that actually the, the, the process, processes in the world which bring about fruitfulness and also uh, remind us that we live in a fr fragile world. Um, and um, some of the insights actually of process theology and panentheism come back to how you, how you understand the freedom that God gives to the world, which brings about a certain fragility to it. Yeah. Um, is that choice not just within human beings, but choice within the physical process itself? Or at least some freedom, if we don't say choice within the physical process, to explore itself. And that we do live in a world which is rich in its diversity, but it is also a world where there's been massive waste in terms of terrestrial mass extinctions. And any, any, any view of God, I think, has to take those things seriously. Um, I'm sorry, that doesn't do justice to them. I think we have one more question, then we'll get instruction for lunch. We'll apologize. In any 
anytime a theory is proposed, uh, in order to get a better feel on the perspective, what is Stephen Hawking's current theology so we can get an idea of where he's coming from with all yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think my answer has to be I don't know. Um, uh, Stephen is um, reticent to talk publicly about his own theological views. This is partly because um, he does have quite a wicked sense of humor and he likes to wind people up from time to time. And it's partly as well that he doesn't want to be owned by various political groups who would seize upon um, any, you know, if he came out and said, um, I signed up to six-day creationism, you imagine the kind of fuss there would be. Um, and therefore, um, I think all we can say is that when, he, in it, when he's serious in his writing, he leaves the question of God open. Um, uh, he occasionally has a dig at Christians. He certainly has a dig in Brief History of Time at, at deism very strongly. And in fact, I, I think coming back to Carl Sagan, um, Carl Sagan, um, when he says this is a book about the absence of God, what Hawking is actually saying is this is a book uh, which, uh, which takes away the argument for a deistic God of the gaps creator. Uh, and I think in that way, I think the Christian church uh, applauds him and thanks him for doing us that service. Um, but I think, uh, I, I, I mean, I can't say anything more publicly than that. Yeah. One, one, can we? Yeah, please. I would like to relate uh, the Big Bang with God. If you study Genesis, I mean, when Moses... Uh, wrote Genesis and said, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. I like to look at that as a big bang. How, how do you... Thank you. Um, I mean, that's a profound question in itself because it, it, it takes us into the whole way that uh, science and the Bible relate. Uh, I, I, like you, find there are things with it within the biblical account which resonate with um, the insights of modern science. What I don't want to do is take it too far. And I think there's a difference between finding things that resonate and saying, that's interesting, or that's helpful to illustrate some truth. Then then taking the thing and saying, well, now let's go through each day of Genesis and try and tie up each image with a particular movement in biological evolution, for example. Now, some people have tried to do this, and there are problems with it. It doesn't quite work. Because I think we're imposing upon there our Western scientific criterion onto a Hebraic text. But having said that, if we believe in inspiration, that God the Holy Spirit was behind the writing of the text, we should actually that there are pictures and resonances which will enhance um, our biblical reading through science. He's the same author of both. So, yes, with you, I mean, I like that. Um, in the beginning, um, the light, and I see that in terms of Big Bang. What I don't want to do is invert the argument and start saying, um, therefore, this obviously proves the truth of God or the truth of Genesis 1 or things of that sort. Thank you. Just some lunch instructions. If you made reservations for lunch, uh, those are being put back here on this back table. So you may pay your, I would form a line starting here and around and carry that. We're just going to have to sit in your chairs and enjoy that or go out in the garden. It's beautiful out there. If you did not make reservations for lunch, we may have a few. If you want to wait around and see. Um, otherwise, you have, I believe, an hour and a half until the lecture begins this afternoon, and we invite you to, to go and enjoy downtown or take a break. But look forward to seeing all of you back this afternoon.